Thank you, Seth. Good morning, everybody. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. You want to know about mine? We went to uh, my daughter-in-law's uh, parents' house, and they had uh, their daughter-in-law's family, who is part Bolivian and part Swedish, and then we had Cindy's sister came and joined us as well, and she brought a dish and some pies, and then the Bolivian side had some Bolivian dishes, and just being the kind of guy I am, I felt obligated to have a little bit of each on my plate, and then they they sent some of it home with us, and I'm going, I'm angry. I'm going home and we're clearing all that stuff out. <laughs> the last piece of pie last night and it's over. <laughs> Do you get on the scales after Thanksgiving? I did. Okay, Luke chapter nine. Uh, please turn there. We've come in our study uh, to the account of the transfiguration of Jesus, and we're going to read this morning verses 28 through 36 of Luke chapter 9. The fact that the transfiguration is recorded in all three of the synoptic gospels underscores its significance. So it's an important Every passage we read and study is important, but I think the fact that it's in all three underscores that significance. Our Lord's um, public ministry encompassed only uh, three uh, action-packed years, uh, but it provided many opportunities for his disciples to come to the understanding that he was more than man the miracles he performed, uh, from turning water into wine, uh, healing the sick, uh, calming the raging sea, raising the dead to life, feeding the multitudes, uh, commanding demonic forces, all of these things. But surely, at least before the resurrection from the dead, none could have impressed upon three fortunate disciples more the glory which belonged to Jesus in his blatant deity than this transfiguration that took place on an undisclosed mountaintop. The first clause in the introductory verse 28 indicating that it took place after these sayings serves notice the event will provide a critical hinge uh, linking Peter's confession in response to Jesus' question, who do you say that I am? You are the Christ of God. Along with the Lord's subsequent uh, shocking revelation of the necessity of the cross for him before glory and of uh, their own crosses, uh, his disciples were to bear on the path of following him. All of those are linked with his inexorable journey to Jerusalem to meet with the fulfillment of his mission of salvation. If you'll but glance at verse 31 of Luke chapter 9 and see there the subject matter of the surprising conversation Jesus was having with Moses and Elijah, uh, speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem, it will signal to us, here now comes the fulfillment of all for which he had come. So picking it up with verse 28, let's read. Some eight days after these sayings, he took along Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face became different and his clothing became white and gleaming. And behold, uh, two men were talking with him, and they were Moses and Elijah, who, appearing in glory, were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. 
Now, Peter and his companions had been overcome with sleep. It's, it's not clear if they had actually fallen uh, asleep or if they were just, as we often get, just really struggling uh, with, with, with sleep, struggling to stay awake. But they, they, were, they had been overcome in this way. But when they were fully awake, he goes on to say, uh, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. And as these were leaving him, you notice little things like that, uh, that, that it was as they were leaving uh, him that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Not realizing what he was saying. And while he was saying this, a cloud formed and began to overshadow them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And then a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent and reported to no one in those days any of the things which they had seen. In our Lord's high priestly uh, prayer, uh, chronicled so beautifully by uh, John in his gospel in the 17th chapter, uh, Jesus prays, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory that I had with you before the world was. What an amazing uh, thought uh, and uh, a, a, a profound statement coming from the mouth of a human being and indicating that the man was unlike any other man and that he shared something wondrous with God himself that existed for eternity but that had for a short time been suspended and that holding was, was glory. The concept of glory is one that we earthbound creatures uh, can typically comprehend only in theory, or at least I can, uh, though God is gracious to us and on occasion will allow us a, a kind of consciousness of what glory is. In the Bible, the word glory itself is most often represented by two words. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew kabod and in the new, doxa. Kabod carries the root idea of heaviness and therefore weight or worthiness. We even, it leaks into our English language. You know, he carries a lot of weight over there, a, a, a lot of heaviness, a lot of importance, a lot of glory. Uh, the glory of Israel was never their armies, it was never their uh, wealth, it was Yahweh their God uh, who dwelt in glory. Such glory that he could not be seen by sinful eyes. The Greek word doxa uh, means something like honor, uh, means something very much like kabod, uh, the, the honor which attaches by virtue of revealing the divine glory. And, and both are rightly seen as legitimate only as they are understood to emanate from and belong to God. Uh, when one thinks of God, he must first and foremost uh, conceive of him in his glory. It's not unusual for you probably to uh, every morning ask God that uh, you might give him glory because he's deserving of glory. It's not unusual probably for you uh, to get up on the Lord's day and pray that what will happen here will that will be that will attribute glory uh, to God. That that's 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 what we uh, desire. This glory is is represented from beginning to end in God's revelation of Himself in the Bible. 
uh, early on, for example, in the expression of a cloud in which uh, during the escape from Egypt and the exodus and the subsequent wanderings, uh, Israel was protected and given assurance by the Lord as he went before them by day in a pillar of cloud and by night in a pillar of fire. Later, there was Moses' experience on Mount Sinai when the <clears throat> Lord first delivered to him his law. Exodus 24, 15 explains how Moses uh, went up on the mountain and the cloud covered uh, the mountain. Uh, the glory of the Lord uh, rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for six days. Uh, in, to the eyes of the sons of Israel, the, I'm reading from Exodus 24, to the eyes of the sons of Israel, the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the, on the mountaintop. Uh, later still, Moses asked the Lord to show him his glory, and, and the Lord told him, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live, and then you know what happened. Uh, the Lord placed Moses in the cleft of the rock, and as he passed by him in his glory, the text there uh, says, he, he covered Moses there uh, with his hand until he had passed by, uh, taking his hand away after he passed by so that Moses could see the back of him, but, but not his face. And eventually when Moses came back down from the mountain, the skin of Moses' face shone. And whenever he went in to talk with the Lord, after he came back, back out, the skin of Moses' face would, would again shine uh, in time. Uh, God gave Israel instructions for his tabernacle where he would uh, symbolically dwell with them. And at the end of the book of Exodus, they erected the tabernacle and the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord filled it. Uh, centuries passed and the same thing occurred with the temple God designed for Solomon to build uh, for him. Fire came down from heaven and consumed uh, the offerings they had brought and the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. In the New Testament, in our very own Gospel of Luke, at the birth of Jesus Christ uh, in chapter 2, the shepherds were staying out in the fields and they were keeping watch over the flocks by night and an angel of the Lord uh, suddenly stood uh, before them. And, and Luke says, the glory of the Lord shone around them. And, and soon a multitude uh, of angels uh, broke out in the song, glory to God in the highest and on earth, uh, peace among men with whom he is pleased. The apostle John would later write, the word became flesh and we beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of, of grace and truth. God is glorious. His creation is glorious. His divine decree is glorious. His word is glorious. And we ourselves are promised uh, all whom he has chosen and, and given to his son to save in his atoning work on the cross that by virtue of that work of the son and our adoption into his uh, family, we will share in his glory. Amazing. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 affirms it. An eternal weight of glory, uh, far beyond all comparison. Our passage concerns itself with the glory of Christ and its meaning for us. Uh, Jesus' petition in his high priestly prayer requesting the restoration of his glory was granted, and now and forever he abides in glory at the right hand of of the Father on high. And three select uh, disciples uh, were early witnesses to it. Well, as I said before, there's a close connection between the Transfiguration passage and what Luke has reported just uh, before. The previous passage concluded with Jesus's admonition concerning uh, what we called the logic of uh, the cross, the irony uh, that uh, those who would seek only to save one's life would lose it, uh, while one who's willing to lose his life for the sake of Christ will save it. And that logic comes into its fullest formulation in verse 26 there. Go ahead and 
look at it, verse 26, as the Lord focuses their attention on what will be their experience in the hereafter. The Son of Man will one day come in glory, and, and only those who have been faithful to Him in this life will experience uh, that glory. Uh, but that points to the future, and in verse 27, the Lord makes a solemn pronouncement concerning the present. There are some of you standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. As Luke proceeds to describe in verse 28, now we're actually at our passage, uh, that it was some eight days after these sayings, the transfiguration took place, the natural interpretation would be that the one was the fulfillment of uh, the other. Here will come the opportunity for some of them to experience in some abbreviated sense the glory of Christ's kingdom. Luke states, again, that it took place some eight days after these sayings. You know, you can go to Matthew and Mark and you'll find there, they say six uh, days later. Uh, that could easily be explained if both events described took place on consecutive uh, Sabbath days. Luke uh, speaking of it inclusively of those days. Matthew and Mark talking about the days uh, in between. Jesus went up on the mountain to pray, uh, which mountain that was has been debated, and we won't get into all those arguments uh, here. Mount Hermon is close to uh, Caesarea Philippi, where some of the previous uh, uh, events, uh, incidents uh, took place. But more importantly, it's consistent with how God had acted historically if you think about it, when he had appeared to uh, Moses and Elijah to give them also a view of his glory. Uh, Moses on uh, Mount Sinai, Elijah at Horeb. Uh, but he took up with him Peter and John and James. We're familiar with those three uh, being mentioned together in the Gospels. They, they clearly seem to have become his closest advisor, associates. Uh, alone accompanying him, for example, at the raising of Jairus' daughter. He took those three in uh, with him. Uh, here, now with him, those three, and later uh, the three of them entering in closer with him in the Garden of Gethsemane. Only Luke provides the information that Jesus went up to pray. And it's here, perhaps, with that thought, uh, with that information where we begin to delve more nearly into his frame of mind after the solemn sayings before. In his humanity, uh, we should not be surprised to find, to learn that events and, and even topics of conversation might seem uh, to trigger emotions that led Jesus to seek especially his father's a fellowship. So he needed prayer to uh, minister to his soul. And, and prayer would have been, this too, prayer would have been the ideal posture for what was about to, to happen. Uh, when he prayed, there was a, a palpable atmosphere of divine communion. The perfect setting. It's also Luke alone who gives the information eventually in verse 32 that Peter and his companions had been overcome uh, with sleep. Perhaps it was evening and that explains it. Uh, it's time for sleep or perhaps they just had another very, very busy day as was their typical uh, practice with uh, Jesus. But as Jesus uh, prayed, they had fallen into some stage of sleep as they would later in the Garden of Gethsemane. They did the same thing. But something awakened them. Uh, while Jesus was praying, Luke states in verse 29, the appearance of his face became different and his clothing became white and gleaming. Uh, Matthew's version is that Jesus' face shone in Mark's that his garments became radiant and exceedingly white as no launderer on earth can whiten them. 
So you can imagine all these descriptions reflecting what the disciples uh, witnessed as they later e explained it. The description of Jesus' face becoming different, or as Luke puts it, indicates some kind of alteration of his countenance that, uh, it so that it became what we might call otherly. If you're reading the Greek text, you see that uh, it, uh, it's otherly, it became otherly. But both Matthew and Greek, eh, Matthew and Mark, uh, use a different Greek word and, and perhaps a more helpful one if we're to understand what actually occurred. They report that Jesus was transfigured, a more literally metamorphosed. It's the Greek verb uh, metamorpho, meaning a change of form. Uh, the word morphe was used to identify the essence of a, a thing as opposed to its outward uh, appearance, which was represented by another Greek word, schema. And so perhaps the best way to describe, I really do think this, the best way to describe what happened is to recall the words of the Apostle Paul in, in that well-known passage in Philippians chapter 2 when he wrote that we should have the same attitude uh, in ourselves that Christ Jesus had who even though he existed in the form of God, there's that word morphe, even though he existed in the morphe of God, he did not regard that equality with God as a thing to be grasped but he emptied himself, uh, taking the form, Morphe again, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Uh, being found in appearance, schema, being found in external uh, appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So when Jesus took on an additional nature, the nature of a man, he assumed the appearance of a man. And that's what the disciples had always seen in him uh, from the outside. He had flesh, he had arms and legs, uh, and facial features, different ones than, than others. Everyone has different, a different external appearance. Uh, but there was more to him than, than that. And in fact, the truth is, the real transfiguration that had occurred at that moment beforehand, when, as the Philippians 2 passage puts it, he, he emptied himself by uh, taking on the morphe of a, a bondservant, of a man. At, at Bethlehem, the eternal Word of God became flesh. And assumed this second nature while at the same time he allowed for a season his divine essence to be veiled. But on the mount, Peter and John and James saw him again metamorphosed, uh, transfigured, uh, this time before their very eyes. What they had always observed in him up to this moment was perceptively altered. Uh, in that moment, as, as William Lane has described it, that the veil of his humanity was lifted and Jesus' body presented itself in the form of tenuously material light. And we've seen that already in the Old Testament. The glory of God is often conceived as shining brilliance or bright light and that Jesus' face uh, shone here and his clothing gleamed indicates that for a brief moment of time, the glory that was Jesus's from all eternity was allowed to shine forth so that the three could see his true essence. His true essence was allowed to shine through in such a way that they were allowed to see him in his pre-human uh, glory and at the same time look forward into his future glory. Jesus had told them there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. And Peter, James, and John were now seeing it. The, the transfiguration was a foretaste, a, a sneak preview and anticipation and guarantee of a glorious reality. It was a fantastic and insurpassable privilege.
But all of that became apparent only upon reflection. The three disciples in the moment had to have been dazed. Uh, for in addition to all else, uh, Jesus was suddenly not alone as he stood before them in the radiance of glory. This only added to their uh, surprise, for Luke underscores it in verse 30 with his, and behold, or, and look. <laughs> that, that's a very common little word in Greek that it do, but it, there's some meaning to it. Look, uh, two men were, were talking with him, and they were Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah, the great lawgiver on the one hand, and equally a great representative of the prophets of old, both of whom were known, if you think about it, <clears throat> to have made their own departures from this mortal world in somewhat mysterious uh, fashion, and who were both anticipated to return again in some role at the end of the world. Uh, these were two of the great figures of the uh, Old Covenant uh, period, talking with the Lord, uh, one known to be a a, a, a prototype of uh, the one who was to come, uh, the other as a precursor of the Messiah who was to come, Elijah. But how did they know that it was Moses and Elijah? We don't know the answer to that, but I didn't want to not <laughs> mention it. How did they know? Uh, perhaps the knowledge came only to them in retrospect, early re retrospect, but some have speculated that here in this environment of the Lord Jesus in communion with his Father, that spiritual sensitivities uh, were heightened so that they, they knew it somehow intuitively. This is Moses and this is Elijah. But the two men also, Luke tells us in verse 31, in appearance, they were themselves abiding in glory. And they were having a discussion with the Lord. And to our eternal delight, Luke uh, even tells us the topic of their conversation. They were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. That gives me goosebumps. Of course they were. What else would they have been talking about at that time? It's just a marvelous thought that these two giants of God's redemptive history would have come down from heaven and met up with the, at the moment, earthbound Son of God. They were talking with him, Luke says. And not only that, but he provides the content of their conversation in verse 31. They were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Literally, they were speaking of his exodus he was about to fulfill. Departure is a fair enough uh, translation. It's the way out. Exodus is the way out. Uh, but the use is unusual. And, and weighty with salvific undertones. For when Moses and Jesus discuss an exodus, there can only be deeper meaning uh, there. The exodus associated with Moses delivered Israel from bondage in, in Egypt. Uh, Jesus, by his exodus, would deliver his people from a far worse bondage. Uh, both were highly beneficial, but the first was typical of the second. For Jesus' exodus was to lead his people on the way out of their sinful world and into heaven, which means that the exodus they were discussing encompassed not just his impending death on the cross, but his resurrection, his ascension uh, as, as well. It could not have been otherwise, as the two were always coupled together, the cross and the resurrection. Peter would later write in 1 Peter 1, 11, that the prophets who had prophesied of the grace to come, they wanted to know uh, what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ 
and the glories to follow. The, the efficacy of the sufferings was proved by the glories that followed. Well, I said at the beginning, you may not have caught it, uh, that the subject matter of the surprising conversation the three were having would serve as a signal to us of the fulfillment of all which Jesus, for which Jesus had come. And here now we see that fulfillment stated plainly, though in different uh, language. For the verb translated accomplish in verse 31, uh, the departure which Jesus was about to accomplish is the Greek pleroo, which means to bring to fulfillment or to bring to completion. In fact, some of your translations have it that way, I think, uh, to bring to fulfillment. And significantly, the locale where this would take place is explicitly at Jerusalem. Uh, that is to be the place of both Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection. And from this point on in the gospel, that culmination of his mission will be the continual focus of Jesus' activities, beginning with the 51st and 53rd verses of this very chapter 9. To use an older uh, biblical phrase, uh, Jesus will set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem. In his zeal to fulfill the divine plan, he will unflinchingly make his way to the place of its accomplishment, of its fulfillment. It will be the goal of his journeys from here on. So here is a most poignant uh, scene. Jesus <clears throat> had proclaimed previously that he had not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. And now he was standing, conversing with the two great servants of God who were emblematic of both law and prophets, and they could only speak of that very thing, of, of its fulfillment. That's what they wanted to talk about. What better evidence could there be of the centrality of the redemption he was to accomplish on the cross? It was the focus of all heaven. But then Peter and his companions, back to them, it seems they did not really hear the content of the profound conversation taking place. In fact, at this point, they were nothing more than background actors. Uh, Luke attributes that in some degree at least to sleepiness. They had either fallen asleep or they were fiercely fighting it. I know we can all sympathize uh, with that. Uh, but finally jarred awake by the glorious scene unfolding before them, uh, better late than never, uh, Peter, uh, seeing perhaps according to verse 33 that the two heavenly persons were moving to go away uh, from, from, from them. Uh, did, he decided to jump in and make his contribution, uh, addressing Jesus as, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, three booths, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. So it was Kent Hughes who said, if there was ever a time for silence, this was it. <laughs> but Peter was prone to speaking first and thinking later. His solution to almost every situation was to open his mouth and talk. Both Luke and Mark attempt to cover somewhat for him uh, Luke suggesting he didn't realize what he was saying. And Mark, in Mark 9, verse 6, attributing it to such terror, he didn't know what to say. I think we can all sympathize with someone who, at a loss for words, said something really stupid. It was Abraham Lincoln who said, it's better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak and remove all doubt. <laughs> But it was good for the disciples to be there. Peter got that right. 
But to place Jesus on the same level as Moses and Elijah betrayed a terrible lack of understanding of who Jesus truly was, despite Peter's wonderful uh, confession uh, before. No matter what purpose he saw in erecting these three booths, uh, whether that was to be hospitable and provide places of rest for them so that they would linger and stay with them a while longer and not depart for them or, 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 or in order to honor them or, or worship them. The result was to dishonor the Lord. So it's not surprising then that in verse 34, uh, just as the words were escaping from his mouth, the signature cloud began forming around them so that it overshadowed them. It was the sign of the presence of the divine. There was no need for tabernacles. The Shekinah glory of the Lord was now taking over uh, this scene. And though it's unclear who exactly was enveloped by the cloud, that the voice came out of the cloud it indicates, I think, that Peter, John, and James were purposely left outside, making God's voice even more authoritative. Here was the needed clarification for the trembling disciples. This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Just as at Jesus' baptism, when the heavenly voice pealed forth to speak to, to his son, uh, here, though directed to his disciples, the message was much the same. Jesus is the son. He is the Messiah of Psalm 2, verse 7. He is the chosen one of Isaiah 42, uh, verse 1. The cho my chosen one in whom my soul delights, says God. And consequently, uh, God is justified in his command. Listen to him. Moses and Elijah were merely his servants, and his majesty and authority overwhelmingly surpass any that belongs to them. The law and the prophets pointed to him and had little consequence really apart from him. So to accord to Moses and Elijah anything near the honor due to God's son is to bring God's word to bear upon them. As the author of Hebrews concisely phrased it in the opening lines of his epistle, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways in these last days has spoken to us in such a person as a son, as his son. Significantly then, the voice still sounding in their ears, uh, Peter and the others looked around and found Jesus alone. He alone deserved their praise, and he alone would need to tread the terrible path ahead and finish the course set by him by the holy counsel of God. So I presented uh, the transfiguration as the way it is presented to us in uh, the Gospels. But it's a fair question to ask, why did it occur? In, in part, we must say it was a benefit to the three disciples and, and by extension to the others, having just been apprised, put yourself in their position, had, having just been apprised that the road ahead for them involved a denial of self and a cross for each of them. The, the spectacle of Jesus' own cross providing the topic of conversation with his heavenly visitors would have underscored the idea that a cross and glory were not incompatible, but instead essential. They belong together. And the disciples were given a glimpse of that glory, bolstering their faith in the reality of the unseen. We, we could all use a boost in our faith in the reality of the unseen. Peter would later write in 2 Peter 1, 16 through 18, these familiar words, we did not follow cleverly devised tales 
when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We ourselves heard the utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. But we must also imagine that the transfiguration and the conversation between Jesus and Moses and Elijah had great significance to the Lord as well. Leon Morris mused about that in his discussion of it. In the quietness, Morris wrote, Jesus had doubtless thought hard about the outworking of his vocation. He was about to go up to Jerusalem to die for sinners. The vision on the mountain set the seal of divine approval on the step he was about to take. So surely both were were true, an encouragement to the disciples, an encouragement to the Lord Jesus. Uh, Jesus had promised that some of those standing with him that day would not taste death until they saw the kingdom of God. And that was fulfilled in what transpired on the high mountain of the transfiguration. They beheld Jesus in his glory. What the disciples needed was encouragement, and the encouragement came in this amazing experience. The transfiguration offered assurance to the three that the events that lay ahead were not to be considered uh, terminal, uh, despite the apparent failure of the cross, They would one day recall this experience and rejoice in the knowledge that Jesus really did uh, gloriously accomplish the task he was sent to accomplish. Planned in eternity past, yet confirmed for them in the transfiguration, they they gained great assurance for their mission. Which mission is our mission uh, as well? Surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, uh, Moses and Elijah, Peter, John, and James as uh, well, we have the same gift of assurance. The departure Jesus awaited then is the work fulfilled just days uh, later. And now, as Peter again would write, we have been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, kept in heaven, reserved in heaven for us. That's our hope. Uh, May God's grace uh, cause it to blaze more fiercely day by day until the veil is finally lifted for each one of us. May that be God's gift to us from this day forward. Let me pray. Father, thank you for the assurance that we have uh, this morning. Thank you for the wonderful assurance that was these disciples this day as you allowed them the privilege of getting uh, a glimpse of the glory that belongs to the triune God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And may we uh, live our lives with that conviction that our faith is real, that uh, the content, uh, the objective of our lives is, is, is real and our future is certain so that our lives will be different and uh, we'll we'll live them in uh, different ways and give honor to you, that we'd give glory to you uh, as we go from this place. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.